Welcome back to the charismatic voice. Honestly, today's song is a bit daunting to me because many of you have hyped it up so much. Add to that, it is one of Russia's longest songs, which is saying a lot because Rush, and it's considered by many to be one of the greatest progressive rock songs of all time. I don't know if I will be able to capture and analyze the essence of it in my first listening, but I'm excited to hear it. So let's get to it. Okay, in the first minute here, I feel like we have just an establishment of the ambiance that we're being drawn into, right? Xanadu, some sort of uh, idyllic paradise. And we get that if you just go back and you like go to uh, the original poem that this is inspired by uh, Samuel Coolidge, I think was the writer of that. And also start to understand a little bit behind the words, Kublai Khan and Xanadu is sort of a retreat for the dynasty in China at the time. This whole idea is there's some sort of uh, gorgeous, wonderful location that we are being drawn into. I think the moment you hear the birds, you're like, oh yeah, that was probably a pretty sweet spot, right? Birds are chirping. Except for me, those birds, I'm pretty sure that they recorded, I think they're probably house finches. And that one particularly sounds like the little babies when they're cheeping and like, feed me, feed me, feed me. So I just have to have to mention that that particular bird chirp <laughs> was like, oh, that was the one that was in my garage for a long time that I couldn't get out of it. I'm going to go back to the beginning. There's some other really cool things here. All right. So sometimes we'll just call this a pedal tone when you've got a note that's held forever and ever. Um, it's like if you put a pedal down on the piano, it just continues to reverberate the whole time. And this, I have to say, this bothered me when I first saw this visualization, right? You see the chimes going back there, but we don't actually hear any chimes yet. That is not the wood blocks that you're hearing clonked on. The chimes that are, are flowing there, they're not present in the audio yet. <laughs> There's your chimes now. <laughs> so that, that synthesizer that's kind of bouncing around here and there, there's, uh, there's I think, a delay between you when you play a note and the sound sort of emerges. This is really fascinating to me how some synthesizers are designed to have a delay from the moment that you trigger them to actually sort of expanding into the sound. And that actually uh, feels somewhat peaceful in my mind, unless you want something exactly on time. And said this, it represents a sort of luxuriousness and that the sound can come out and blossom in its own time. It doesn't have to be really attached to a particular time signature. So I like the way that it can wind and create beautiful sounds without being uh, obligated to time. Thank you. 
I think because we have this uh, very much out of tempo feeling, you get that relaxed ambiance. You also have birds. It makes you feel like maybe I'm in the woodland somewhere. Also because you have wooden blocks that are being tapped on or clonked on. Uh, it definitely feels like a location that is in nature. And they've established that beautifully, all while having some underlying, some sort of uh, spiritual element because you have this music that's just continuing to be present in that bass. We have a repetition of a melody there. That might be a hook that comes back later. I don't know. We'll see. Tubular bells? Oh. Bending tubular bells like that. It's like a like a wedding gone wrong. evolution of how this faded in and really this is the first time that we've got a time that has been established it was very uh fluid and uh, had like an amorphous kind of feeling up until the guitar started establishing it yes there was a repetitiveness in time of the tubular bells but they weren't actually uh there wasn't any sort of subdivision in the beat yet that gave us a sense that we had a time signature until uh, you had that guitar entrance in there. And there's something that feels incredibly epic about it too. It reminds me, I can't put my finger on it, but it reminds me of another guitar riff that I analyzed recently on the channel. We'll see if it comes up, up in my mind. What is that? What is that riff familiar? Let me know in live chat what that reminds you of. It's really familiar. Maybe it's Sweet Child of Mine? Maybe. Maybe that's... I think that might be why it feels familiar. It's familiar, but different. It sort of has like an excursion in a different direction after a few notes. It's still really typical. Peart is essentially warning us that this is going to go somewhere so much bigger. All of these fills, they almost feel a little bit over the top to me at times, but then we have this space in between and this repetition of the riff. So it feels like he's sort of um, getting us really excited for a moment and then letting us simmer and then getting us excited again. It's definitely doing a great job of building up the anticipation. <laughs> Just 
little side note here. I think that we're in a 7-8 time signature at this point, which they've made feel somewhat normal because of how cyclical that riff is. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I'll go back just a little bit and count that out. the double necks on both of those instruments are just so much uh oh, that's, that's really cool uh the shift is like we've had two definitive chapters already going into a third one and it's really surprising to me that this had uh so much evolution in the second chapter and i thought we were going to take that straight into some sort of singing and it didn't go there. So I feel I feel like my expectations have been shifted a bunch already. Let's see where else it goes. exciting because of the way it hits that bottom note just slightly ahead of the downbeat of each measures measure so we've got like a one two three four one two three four just a four four time signature that's happening but you get boom, ba, ba, da, 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 boom. and that little bow when it goes down to the low note it goes just a little bit ahead of the one two three four the downbeat being the strong beat that is at the beginning of each measure and it makes it almost feel like it's not a normal time signature. It's a, it's definitely, it's like a little jab each time. <laughs> evolving entirely. <laughs> I loved that. That was that was such a, a, a really fun little uh, extra percussion moment. Oh, this is this is really cool. It's so uh, so uplifting. I think I want to say that. He's got like different sizes of cowbells that he's playing in a very particular way to create this sound. It might be a slightly different percussion instrument. <laughs> I like that sound. One more time. <laughs> I'm 
one of the reasons I think this works really well here is because this particular sound has a quick fade, has a quick attack and a quick fade. So we get more space between each sound that's made, like a little more, uh, not total silence, but just a little more quiet between each sound. So it has sort of like a, like a, like bubbles coming up kind of feeling. <laughs> It's always amazing to me how three people can make so much sound together. And it's so intricate and well woven together. They, I mean, this really is a power trio here. Incredible. I love the slappiness in that bass. Like that luxurious, lugubrious kind of feeling back. Ooh, ooh, back to turbulent. Such a big shift in the tempo overall and, and bringing the tubular bells back definitely sort of harkens to a moment earlier. It's, it feels like uh, in Xanadu, we're kind of getting different flavors of maybe different scenes or images that might be in this uh, city of paradise. And there are moments that seem really fun and uplifting, like, I don't know, maybe kids playing or something like that. And then you've got moments where maybe you're just lounging underneath a tree and it's the perfect temperature outside. I, I think we're definitely back to a lounging moment here. And uh, we're nearly five minutes into the song and I haven't heard a vocal yet. I thought there were vocals in the song, but maybe I'm wrong. I'm actually, maybe? We're gonna find out. Feels like if there are, they should be into it by now. There we go. Of course, of course there are vocals because I had some lyrics ahead of time. I just had a lot of doubt because that was a really long instrumental intro, but he looked like he was approaching the mic. So I was like, okay, I think this is gonna happen. Let's go back a little bit. So, Getty Lee, many of you, when you were recommending Getty to me, uh, many of you said, well, you should absolutely listen to him, but you're probably going to hate his voice. And I was so surprised when I first listened to him because 
I, I felt nothing of that distaste for his sound whatsoever. There's a specificity to his sound that works so perfectly in this power trio, but it there's a, a uniqueness as well. So it's got this signature sound to it, but there's nothing about his sound that I hate. Nothing. I think other people might dislike sort of a certain nasality that is there in the sound. There's definitely a, a very forward focus. Um, and it, it's probably just part of that signature sound that he has um, partly from his genes, from the bone structure in his face. And there's something about that timbre, I'm guessing, that some people don't like. But I just, I like having unique sounds. I like the signature that he puts on every single note he sings. I'm going to go back one more time to where he begins. Uh, Here-ish? To seek the sacred river out To walk the caves of ice He is very specific with the rhythm of his words. Words, all words have... Uh, inherent rhythm to them just by the combination of consonant, consonants, vowel, vowels that are included in that word. And he's so specific about where certain consonants and vowels come in and where they end. I think that this is largely developed because he's a bass player too. And bass players have to be so particular about their rhythm. River out to walk the caves of ice. To break my fast on honeydew And drink the milk of paradise And when you have a longer moment like that where the words are elongated more, you can notice some of the specificity more because that requires the singer to make choices about where is the diphthong going to take place. Are you going to linger more on that first vowel or the second vowel of the diphthong? Where exactly is that consonant kind of come in? There's, if somebody has a lot of rhythmic experience, they'll often choose subdivisions in the beat for placement of consonants, which is exactly what Getty Lee is doing. Let's, I'll go back just a tiny bit, we'll continue for now. I'm sure we're gonna get into this with more detail soon. The milk of paradise. I really dig the way that it sounds so easy for him to go up, uh, but then he has just a teensy bit of a little edge to the sound, just a tiny bit of distortion. And even more than that, I dig how much his mouth is moving while not disturbing the focal point of his sound. So he's getting really, really clear lyrics to us. I understand all the words. It's just blah. It's like a, the Pez dispenser mouth thing we've got going on. And I love the view in this video where you can see that too. And then with that, if, if you're moving your mouth a ton, that is shaping the resonance that your sound is coming through. So it's really easy when somebody's moving their mouth a whole bunch for them to sort of lose focus on the sound. It takes lots of practice to learn how to keep the sound in the same focal point while moving around to create really, really clear and rapid lyrics. So I have a lot of appreciation for what he's doing right now. <laughs> what is the <this> sound? <laughs> this is such a squeaky high sound. I didn't. 
<laughs> didn't expect that. A, a really good example of choosing when a vowel should end and a consonant begin is in this Xanadu part. Some singers would choose to go Xanadu and sing to the end a lot more. There's an absolute choice though that needs to be made here of am I going to continue the first a vowel or the n consonant? Which one is going to be longer? And here he's going for definitely way more time on the a vowel. It is so very deliberate. So very short on the end there. And his eyebrows there, they uh, they kind of remind me of Justin Hawkins, that particular shape. <laughs> so high. It's even accentuated by a xylophone, I think. Man, the percussion and this is just within the pleasure dome, decreed by Kubla Khan. Wow. This section is a great example of something that I'll sometimes call sprinkling consonants on top. He's being, again, extremely precise about his timing. And when he goes to a consonant, he tends to make it very, very quick. It's a, a kubla con. There's nothing, uh, nothing lingering. So if I said like kubla con, for example, I could say Kubla Khan, where I'm really going through each consonant like it was a bit of mud. You can really linger on them, really draw them out. And instead he's doing this sprinkle on top. So most of the time is spent on the vowel. This helps with the legato. And he's going Kubla Khan. So all of those consonants are super, super crisp and extremely timed with subdivisions of the beat. I'll go back a little bit to catch some more of that. Maybe here. To stand within the pleasure dome, decreed by Kubla Khan. There. To taste on you the fruits of life. And the every now and then he'll pick the pots that's really more. I will say, almost every time that he has a diphthong where the second vowel is an E, diphthongs are one sound that actually contains two vowels. So I, the word I, like me, myself, and I. I is actually made of an A and an E, I, I. And he spends more time on the second part of that diphthong and goes to the E quicker. I think that's just because he likes E vowels better. You may have heard me say this in a previous analysis of him, that everybody has a particular vowel that uh, is a preferred vowel. I actually really like E vowels. Oohs are pretty good too, but I, I like E vowels more than A vowels for sure. And maybe, maybe it's just a natural tendency for him, or maybe he knows that that's the vowel he likes better, likes to sing on more. So he is drawn to it and goes to it a lot quicker. <laughs> very specific about his rhythm, about his vocal tone, keeping it in a pocket that is his pocket the whole time. And then he also has got so much control over the technique. So as it's going up and down, I don't get big bursts of a much louder dynamic on top. I get a definitely continuity through the bottom of the sound as well. It's a very controlled sound, but then you add to it moments where he has extra distortion or edge. And that gives it a more emotional aspect too. I 
have so much respect for what Geddy Lee does with his voice. Let's keep going. <laughs> dig the chapters of this and I really like the way that they have that devolving moment again that seems like such a fun extension of this uh, idea a musical idea that they've established and then they explore it further that to me is the definition of progressive it's like how can we progress the music into a new place <laughs> <laughs> so interesting how both times they when he comes to Xanadu at the end he sings it again a second time in a totally different way like saying it once made him kind of wander in his thoughts to another area so that he needed to sing it again I, it's fascinating how Rush makes transitions from one part to the next. And I wonder often how those transitions have come to be. And I wonder if maybe this particular transition happened because as they were reading some poetry, they went, oh, Xanadu, oh, Xanadu. Like, what would, how, how can you say that in a different way? <laughs> out of this world. Held within the pleasure dome Decreed by Kubla Khan How can you not appreciate this man's enunciation? When you see that kind of view of his mouth, you go, wow, it is moving so much, yet somehow he still has that same focus. Like think about other instruments, uh, a wind instrument, for example. Uh, you have different notes that you can, um, you can push a stop in and you can change where the air is gonna be exiting. But that overall instrument, it's still structurally the same all the time. When you're moving your mouth this much, it's like it's like you had a, a clarinet that was made of Play-Doh. It's just continuously molding in different ways. So to be able to maintain focus like this with this much mouth movement, that takes so much perfecting. And it's incredible how clear it is. Held within the pleasure dome, decreed by Kubla Khan. To taste my bitter triumph as a mad immortal man. Never more shall I return. This king these gates are nice. mine. For I have dined on honeydew. I just adore the amount of cut he has in his upper sound. It is a very specific sound, yes. And it still has like a certain, it's like a, there's a 
there's definitely nasality in it, but there's a certain bell behind it. So it's like a nasal bell to me at times because of the way it's piercing, but not, uh, it doesn't feel crazy aggressive. I've heard much more aggressive sounds. Uh, Judas Priest, for example, right? Rob Halford's like the whole time. His has got that focus, but there's a certain, um, yeah, I think like if I think about a hand bell, that it reminds me of something that has a brilliance and a little bit of mellowness to it, just a tiny bit, but then a lot of nasal focus. I left the cries up there. He's wailing up there, and there's moments where the it actually sounds like the vocal folds are about to burst apart because there's so much breath pressure that is built up beneath the vocal folds in this high, powerful moment. And you hear it where like it, it starts to crack just a little bit, which is actually a release of pressure. Cracking, though it can sound absolutely terrible, can actually be good for the voice because it's releasing all of the built up pressure. And I hear that entering his voice here, but he's somehow still really controlling it. Right there. Wow, it's like a squeak that comes through. Ooh, you know, I actually just realized, I think that might be the last I think that's the last lyric that's here and it's Woe Is It Paradise, which is fascinating to me because they've talked about this, this sort of incredible area and uh, there's a lot of thought put into these lyrics, but this question at the end of, is it paradise? You know, the birds are chirping. Maybe that bird is really just yelling for food all the time and it's not such a paradisical place. Is that a word? Let me know if that's a word. <laughs> Makes me think that that temperature is perfect. I feel like this is the guitar's response to that question of, whoa, is it paradise? This felt like a continuation of that thought into moments that were just totally over the top and glorious, but then there were moments that had some more tension in it that definitely, it was exploring an idea that was fantastic. Side note, I read that uh, that Rush performed Xanadu frequently live as well. And that it was always different every time because you have these extended instrumental sections and that just is really exciting to me. I mean, I wonder what this solo would be like in another performance and in another one. It'd be so fun to see how that evolved over time. I'm gonna go back just a little bit into it and then we'll keep going. <laughs> That circular riff. That seven eight riff that we had earlier, so it's almost like a circle in the whole song. Ooh. 
something about this shift makes me think that they reversed the riff or they did something, they evolved it in some very particular way so that it's very heavily related to the one that was earlier. Oh man, there is no possible way that you can understand how all of that goes together in our first listening of it. It is just such an incredible work. I all of the chapters, and you could I could hear the glimmer of how those chapters were intertwined, how they circled back, but I didn't get all the details. I just need to listen to it like 200 million times more because that's how many times it would take to get to the bottom of how incredible this composition is. If you want to see some more first time analysis of a uh, very, very difficult songs where I feel like I need that 200 million more times to listen to it and really get it, you can check out this playlist over here and may you fall more in love with music every day. <laughs>